It's a great responsibility to stand here before you tonight and address you about the things of God. I say that in all seriousness because so many of us have difficulty laying hold of spiritual truth as it's revealed in God's word. And therefore, whenever the responsibility is mine to try and share something of that word with other people, I take it very seriously. And I would ask you tonight to be very patient with me if I share with you a story which I have shared with many people about an old sheepdog which shared my life for a number of years. I'm a man with a great deal of humor, and I can't help but be somewhat amused by the fact that I've had to change my shirt three times in the last four hours in preparation for this showing tonight. And right now I'm wearing somebody else's shirt. <laughs> also, it must be a modern miracle when Longhorn Texans invite a Canadian sheep man to come down and speak to them. <laughs> but in the quietness of this hour, I trust that God will take a simple story with which he has taught me many, many enormous lessons as to his own character and to what he asks of me as his person, and that he will in turn instruct you tonight, and that his gracious spirit will make these very real to you, very meaningful, and truths which you can actually lay a hold of and retain within your spirit for the rest of your life. Before I do that, may we bow our heads in a moment of prayer, please. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father, in the quiet of this hour, I pray that your gracious Spirit would move amongst us in a very profound way, that he would speak to us in the very depths of our spirit, and that he would elicit a response within our wills to do your will that he might enable us to see you as you really are in your gracious, generous manner. Be very precious to us, we pray tonight. I have asked this for our sakes, but I ask it in your name. For Christ's sake also I ask it. Amen. As a young man, I grew up with cattle. And as I matured, I became very ardent as a cattle man. In fact, I worked on large cattle ranches both in California and Alberta. And at the age of 25, I was given the great honor of being made the manager of one of the finest cattle ranches in British Columbia. The only place in the world where there are bigger cattle ranches is in Texas. We have some very, very large ones up there. When at the age of 27, I decided that I wanted to go into ranching on my own, I bought a very magnificent property which lay on a peninsula of land jutting out into the ocean on the southernmost tip of Vancouver Island. This piece of property was very secluded. It was at the very end of the road, and it was surrounded on two sides with two miles of ocean frontage. Because it was an estate sale and I had to pay cash for it, when I had bought the property, I didn't have sufficient money to buy cattle, and so I was obliged to purchase sheep in order to make a living. And in the years following that purchase, I often thought to myself and wondered to myself, often very audibly, and to my wife and to the Lord, why am I stuck with sheep on a sheep ranch? And I would simply say in passing to you tonight, if some of you are in positions or in situations in which you are asking, why am I stuck in this situation? I would like to encourage you by helping you to understand that God may have very great purposes for you in having placed you where he did, in the way he did. Because out of this sheep ranch, and out of my association with sheep, and out of my association with this dog that I'm going to tell you about, God has seen fit in his own gracious and wonderful way to enrich not only my life, but the lives of many, many other people. It became very apparent to me very quickly that I could not handle sheep with a cattle dog. I had brought a beautiful big cattle dog down to the property with me, but he had no capacity for sheep. And one day there was an advertisement in the newspaper which simply read, wanted good country home for purebred border collie chases cars and bicycles.
I didn't have a phone in my home, so I got in my old car and drove up to the neighbor's ranch and phoned the owner of the dog and was told that she still had the animal and would I please come at once and have a look. <laughs> when I arrived at the gate of the house, the lady was already waiting for me. And she said, Mr. Keller, I am very sorry, but this dog is completely crazy. She's local. I can't do a thing with her. All she wants to do is chase boys and chase bicycles, chase cars. She'll jump every fence in the neighborhood, and we can't do a thing with her. And so I said, well, may I please have a look at her for myself? And she took me around to the back of the home, and as I approached the dog, the dog leaped at me, snarling and baring its teeth. And then it collapsed and fell on, in a heap on the ground. And to my amazement, I saw that not only was the dog chained with a chain from its neck to a post, but the owner had gone so far as to hobble it with another chain from its collar to its back leg. I asked the lady, I said, how old is this beautiful animal? Because he was a magnificent specimen of the breed. She said, she's two years old. And I said, well, you know, at that age, practically every dog has learned everything he'll ever know. And I looked into the eyes of this beautiful, beautiful Border Collie. And may I explain to you, some of you may not be familiar with the Border Collies. This is a breed of dog that was developed in the Border Counties in the north of England and south of Scotland and have been bred for hundreds of years just for the purpose of handling sheep. This is their enormous capacity. It's inbred in them and has been for generations by master breeders. And when I looked in those beautiful eyes, well-formed head, magnificent constitution, beautifully proportioned animal, I, I could see a potential for great good. I said to the lady, Madam, this is too beautiful a dog to be destroyed, at least by me. And I will make you a proposition. I will take, the dog was called Lassie. Isn't that an unusual name? <laughs> I will take Lassie home on probation for six weeks. And if I cannot do anything for her within six weeks, it will be your responsibility to have her destroyed. And we struck a bargain, and she said, I'd be happy to let you do that. So I put the dog in the back of my old car. And to give you an idea how old the car was and how old I am, that car had wooden wheels, wooden spokes. And all the way out, the 27 miles to our ranch, I kept putting my hand back trying to pet this dog, trying to reassure her, speaking to her in low, well-modulated tones. And all I would get was snarls and growls, and she'd lay her ears back. When we got home, I had prepared a kennel for her. We had a bowl of fresh water and another dish with lovely, delicious food. And we presented all of this to the dog, and she refused. She refused everything. She refused to go into the kennel. She refused to drink the water. She refused to eat the food. And this went on day after day, and she began to lose condition. And finally, I said to my wife, if I don't unshackle her, she's going to die on our hands. And I must set her free. I simply must set her free. And I'm sure that she will probably disappear. And sure enough, as soon as I unshackled her, she was gone. Now, our cottage was adjacent to a very wooded area with large rock outcrops. And the dog just disappeared into the forest. For a day or two, I tried to find her. I drove up and down the road. I went to adjoining ranches. There were all large ranches in the area and asked the people to keep an eye open for her. There was no sign of her. Two or three days later, one evening I looked up and there crouched on a large outcrop, just the way a cougar would crouch on a rock. Here was this dog looking down at me. And so I got a flash of inspiration, and I took her bowl of water up there, and I took her dish of food. And sure enough, the next morning, it was all gone. And so I did this day after day. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, that dog would not come. 
She would not respond. She didn't show the least inclination to reciprocate in any way to the overtures I made to her. But one evening I noticed, quite unexpectedly, that when some of the sheep came grazing by, her latent instincts, which had been bred and produced in her by generations of famous breeders, began to come alive. And she began to sit up, and she'd pay careful attention, and she would watch the sheep cock her head and look this way. She'd never seen sheep. So I got the bright idea that if I brought the sheep up there in the evenings after my day's work was done, and I would just bring her up gently with a little flock of sheep and bring them in her neighborhood, perhaps she would become interested enough, and somehow some rapport would be established between us. Nothing seemed to work. And week was now following week, and the time was approaching that she might have to be destroyed. I want to reassure you that though I had not made personal contact in an intimate way with this dog, I still had an enormous compassion for her, and I was very, very fond of her. And I had an enormous longing, somehow, for her to, and I to become friends and to work together. About this time, one night, I wasn't really paying attention to the dog at all. I was standing, it was a gorgeous summer evening, and the sun was setting out over the ocean. I was standing with my hands behind me like this, just watching the sunset and watching this beautiful, tranquil pastoral scene with the sheep grazing in the foreground, when suddenly I felt a warm nose in my hand. I tell you, my heart just about skipped a beat. Was, was I ecstatic? She had come of her own choice and touched my hand. Well, it was the beginning of a most remarkable association between us. She discovered before long that she had found somebody whom she could really trust, somebody who really loved her, somebody who really understood her, somebody who had only her best interests in mind, somebody who understood all about dogs and all about sheep and all about ranching. The consequence was that she very readily began to learn to obey commands. She learned all of the commands that any dog normally learns in this business. She would come, sit, lie down. Even if she was coming at me full speed and I just held up my hand because eventually she learned all hand signals and she would work to hand signals, she would just drop. She could go out to the right, she could go out to the left, she could gather in a whole flock of two or three hundred ewes without any trouble. In fact, this dog became so valuable to me that she was worth two or three men on that ranch for me as the owner. One of the interesting things about the animal was this, that instead of wanting to be away from me, she now became what everybody called my shadow. If I sat here, she would sit here. If I got up and moved over there, she would get up and move over there. She became a virtual shadow to me. In fact, she became such a one-man dog that unless I fed her, she would not eat. Unless I watered her, she would not drink. Even when I went away, she would simply go on to a fast while I was away and would not eat or drink even though my wife fed her. And this was because of her enormous devotion to me as an individual and because of the fact that she had come to love and trust me so implicitly. Coupled with this was an amazing thing. All of the capacities which had been instilled within her to handle sheep were coming to life. And she was discovering that to work with me and to comply with my wishes and to cooperate with me and to obey my commands was the epitome of life for her. This is what she had been made for. This is what she had been bred for. This is what she had been brought into existence for. And coupled with this was something which touched me very deeply, and that is 
that she found enormous pleasure in this. Her eyes would just sparkle and shine. And she found tremendous pleasure and satisfaction and delight in simply serving. One of the commands that she had the greatest difficulty with was the simple command to stay. Now, that might not seem important to you, but on a ranch, this is one of the key instructions given to a sheepdog. Often it's to hold a bunch of sheep in the corner of a field, or it may be to watch a corral gate, or it may be to just hold one or two individuals that have been separated from the rest of the flock. But it's a key responsibility entrusted to a dog. And in some cases, the owner will allow the dog to stay in that one position for three quarters of an hour, even an hour, while he's busy doing other things. And sometimes it was necessary to actually get out of her view and get out of her sight, in which case she would start to become a bit uneasy because I wasn't within view of her. Out of all of these sort of experiences, God began to show me in very remarkable ways, which I wish to go into in a few minutes with you, how he wants to work with us and wants us to work with him. Another thing which was very interesting to me and which taught me a great thing was the fact that as she became more and more expert at handling livestock, I could go out into very rough terrain, and we had some very rough terrain. And out there, I, because I was taller than her, I could see over the brush, I could see over the windfalls, I could see over the rough ground and see sheep that needed to be gathered up in some cases out of the pastures. She couldn't, you see, she was away down at this level. And I would say, Lass, you have to go out and fetch them in. You have to go out and bring them in. There's some over there yet. And without any hesitation, she would go bounding away through the timber and through the underbrush and through the rose bushes and over the windfalls and gather in these sheep. And it wasn't easy. She'd come out of there sometime and her face would be scarred and scratched with thorns and brush and her feet sometimes would be cut and her fur would be full of burrs and what have you. But she was glad to go because it was my wish and my desire. She was not a perfect dog. She had several weaknesses. And these were rather amusing and yet quite serious. Just off of shore in front of where we lived, there were several rocky islands. And on one of these islands there was a grove of scraggly trees. And on this little island, was what we call a rookery, a crow's rookery. This is where they nested. They thought they were safe there from molestation. And so the crows would come flying over our fields and cawing at the dog and taunting her and teasing her and tormenting her. And of course, it was more than she could stand, and so she would go flying after them. And I have very seldom seen a dog that could run like Lassie could run. She seemed to float over the ground, quite literally just pursuing these crows in flight. Another habit that she had, very similar, was when the crows migrated to the south in the wintertime, and we had large land-clearing fires, and the flames were sending up huge sparks into the overcast, why she would go bounding after these sparks. And of course, sometimes they'd catch in her fur and start to burn, and you'd smell hot fur burning. And she would roll in the grass, and then she would come bounding back to me, all shining with her eyes and her tongue out and smiling and saying, Isn't that a great show, boss? <laughs> well, really, it wasn't, because, you see, it didn't benefit the ranch one iota, and it didn't do me any good, and it didn't help the sheep, and it just wore her out. And so she would have to be disciplined, and she would have to be corrected. And she had to be taught that irrespective of what the temptations were that surrounded her, she was to be loyal and devoted to the task appointed to her. When the discipline was all over, I would say to her, Lass, it's all over now. We're friends again. Because she could detect that something had come between us. And she would leap into my arms and she'd race around in a circle and I'd gather her up and hug her. And there was a complete reconciliation. 
And so this is how this dog and I shared a number of years together on this ranch. And she was a large part of making our operation there a success. In fact, she became so well known and so famous that people would drive all the way from the city and come out and they'd heard about this dog and they would ask just for the privilege of watching her work, watching her handle sheep, seeing her do the tremendous responsibilities which were hers. Now I would like to take the time with you to make a spiritual application here step by step all the way through. Because it was through this that God began to reveal to me as a young man in a very clear and very emphatic way not only what he himself was like, but in turn also what he desired from me. You will recall that in the New Testament we are told clearly that as God's people we are workers and co-workers with Jesus Christ. May I pause here a moment? A lot of us have the idea we work for God. No, no. We work with God. And God works with us. And there's a world of difference in this view. You will recall also that after his resurrection and Jesus came to speak to his friends beside the lake, remember he had called them from their fishing and he had prepared a bountiful breakfast of roast tilapia fish and fresh baked japatis roasted on the coals for his friends. They were sitting around satisfied and well-fed and enjoying the warmth of the fire in the early morning light. He said to his friend Peter, he said, Peter, do you really love me? Peter, are you really fond of me? If you read this in Philip's translation, which I brought with me tonight, you will find that he addresses Peter as his friend. And he said, my friend, I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to have a part in my purposes upon the planet for you. I want you to have a specific role to play in working with me in order to touch other lives and to bring other people in to get to know me. And so these are some of the lessons which I learned from working with Lassie, and I would like to go over those with you carefully. You will recall that I told you that the Border Collies are bred with a certain enormous capacity to serve. This is why they win practically every world championship when it comes to the championships that are held for handling sheep. It's an inherent, intrinsic part of their very makeup. And I would like to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, tonight in all seriousness that you must consider the fact that when God made you, you were made with a capacity for great things. You were made with a potential to do great service, to touch many lives, to bring great pleasure to God himself. And one of the things that happens to many of us is that we fall under the ownership of the wrong master. And I have lived long enough to say to you tonight in great earnestness that many of our lives are misspent and misdirected because we are under the wrong ownership. This lady that owned Lassie didn't have a clue about dogs. She didn't have a clue about sheep dogs in particular. And she had no way, nor did she appear to care at all what happened to this magnificent animal. In fact, I got the distinct impression that the two years they had been together had been very horrendous years for both of them, both her and the dog. I have young people in particular coming to me all the time and saying, but Mr. Keller, I'm a free will person. I'm a free will agent. I can do as I wish. I can do as I like. And I reply in all earnestness, and I say, but I'm sorry, you aren't really free. Because what has happened to you, you are unaware of it, but you are actually shackled. And you have actually forged chains around yourself by giving play to those instincts which are naturally within you, but for the wrong purposes. And you are expending your life, you are expending your energies in ways which are nothing but self-destructive. 
just as this dog had literally forged and put the shackles of chains upon herself by misdirected energies. That's a serious thing for us to consider. And the amazing thing is, my friends, that very often when God in Christ, by his spirit, approaches us, and he is the good shepherd, may I reiterate that again to you tonight, he is the good shepherd. When he who understands us, who has understood us from the time of our conception, who understands all of our genetic makeup, who understands all of our environmental background, who understands all of those influences which have been brought to bear to make us the kind of men and women which we are, when this one approaches us and offers to liberate us and offers to set us free, many, many of us recoil from him. We really do. I'm not holding people to blame and I'm not putting people down by saying that. The reason is because so often we have been under the wrong ownership and we have been so abused and misused whether by the enemy of our souls or by our own selfish self-interest or whatever it may be that has shackled us that we're afraid to trust the living God. We are actually afraid and intimidated to respond positively to the overtures of the living Christ as he comes to touch our lives and comes to set us free. Just as I had nothing but the best interests of this dog in mind, I had nothing but her well-being, the very center of my motivation and all of my contacts with her. I had nothing but the very highest aspirations for her. She still was reluctant to respond. I saw this very clearly. I had provided her with a beautiful fresh kennel. I had set out food for her. I had set out drink for her. I was prepared to lavish love and affection and kindness upon her. But she spurned all of this. And even after she was set free, though it was my hands that had set her free as a dog, though she partook of these things, she still would not respond. I see this all the time in human behavior. There are men and women, some of them have grown up within the context of a Christian home or a Christian family. They may have grown up in the environment of a Christian community. They may have had the benefit of a church family. There are many in our nation who've never had that opportunity, but they've had the legacy of a nation founded under God. And all of the tremendous benefits which come with that. And people are very ready and willing to participate and partake of those advantages and those benefits with ever actually capitulating to Christ and actually coming under the lordship and the ownership of the living God. I would like to pause here a moment, if I may, and speak to you very earnestly about this matter. For many years, I could not understand as a man when people told me, look, God does not condemn anybody. I could not understand that. You remember Jesus himself said, I came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. And as the weeks went by in my dealing with this dog, endeavoring to entice her to come to me, appealing to every instinct within her that I knew of to draw near to me. I had done everything within my power, everything within my capacity, to try and elicit some kind of a positive response from this beautiful creature. Ultimately, the decision as to whether or not she would make that fast and final move that would last rested with her. I had done everything that I could to win her trust and win her affection. And I say to you again in solemnity tonight that God our Father in Christ and by his gracious spirit comes and he solicits every possible sort of manifestation of his love towards us. He woos us and he draws us and he calls to us. And so many of us are impervious. We don't respond. You see, faith in God is simply my response to his overtures to the point where I actually will act 
to the point in which I will actually move out to do the thing God is asking me to do. And unless that beautiful dog had finally made that crossing of that barrier and touched me, I would have been powerless to change your life. Isn't it beautiful how that when she did finally do that, she discovered somebody who really, truly loved her. Somebody who truly understood her. Somebody who, despite all of her background, despite all of her uneasiness, despite all of her fear and her anxiety and her timidity, was willing to overlook that and would express complete love and trust and acceptance to this creature. And the Spirit of God spoke to me very, very profoundly to that, and he said, Philip, even in your life, I have tried to do this for years and years and years, and you always hold back. You always tend to draw back. You won't respond. May I share a great truth with you? As the dog learned to trust me, I learned to trust her. May I repeat that? As the dog learned to trust me and respond to that which I was trying to do with her, increasingly I found that I could trust her. It's a mutual interaction. And I would say to you tonight that as you come to discover that God our Father is so totally trustworthy, his character is of such a caliber that his integrity is absolutely impeccable. There is no credibility gap with Christ. As I so often like to say, he is the perfect gentleman. He is the perfect gentleman. And he can be relied upon. He can be depended upon. And as you invest even a fragment of faith in the character of this one who comes to you and draws near to you and appeals to you to become his person, you will discover that because he is totally trustworthy, he in turn will start and entrust you with more and more. And this was one of the beautiful t things that took place between Lassie and myself was this increasing trust, this increasing bond of mutual affection, of mutual harmony, of mutual cooperation. And she learned to love to obey. So many people have the idea it's difficult to obey God. Somehow they think it's a drag. They think it's a big bore. And I would say to you tonight, for the man or woman who has truly come to know the living Christ, to obey him, is to love him. Some of you are looking at me a little bit quizzically when I say that. So I'm not going to go into it, but I would urge you, if you go home tonight after these sessions and have some time that you read John 14, 15, 16, you will find there our Lord himself repeatedly made the statement over and over that if you really love me, you will prove and demonstrate this love by being obedient to me, by complying with my wishes, by keeping my words, by cooperating with me. This is how we demonstrate our love for God. And so there was this amazing, I like to call it triad, of cooperation that developed between us. She trusted me, I trusted her. I gave her commands, she carried out those commands. And in it all, there was enormous pleasure, enormous delight, if you will. I don't know of anything that impressed me so much during those years as the fact that in this dog, there was this element, this ecstatic element of just sheer delight in pleasing the boss, if you will. A people would come and they would remark, they'd say, it's incredible how that dog just seems to want to please you. Well, I said, she does. She does please me. She's not doing this out of a sense of duty. She's doing this out of a sense of delight. It's fun for her. It's fun for me. We're in this together. And everybody's benefiting. 
Just a word here, please. So many people don't want us speakers to talk about obedience nowadays. We live in a very permissive society. So I've tried to substitute as a layperson all kinds of words. I call it cooperation. I call it compliance. Uh, you name it. But may I say this, that whatever you want to call it, your obedience to the desires and the wishes and the will of God are not an, only an enormous blessing to him. They not only enrich the life of God. And many people don't realize that we can do that. But the word of God makes it so clear that we can bless God. It enriches our own lives. But the amazing thing is the benefit it is to others around us. And this was the case with Lassie. Because it was through her cooperation, it was through her obedience, that the whole flock benefited, that the whole ranch operation became a tremendous success, that everything functioned as smoothly and as efficiently as it did in our work together. I mentioned earlier to you that one of the hardest things for this beautiful dog to learn was the simple command, stay. And God spoke to me very clearly out of that. He might not speak to all of you as clearly about it, because some of you may be sort of lethargic people. But for anybody that's got initiative, and anybody that's got drive, and anybody that wants to see things happen, when God puts you into a situation which to you appears to be a dead end, which appears to you to be static, in which nothing is happening, in which nothing is taking place, our response is to feel suddenly I'm on the shelf. I'm not in the action anymore. I don't have a part in the great plans that are developing. And we tend to question God. There was a period of many years in my life where this was the case. And I used to question very seriously, and some of those years were on this ranch, whether in fact God had some specific purpose in mind for me. It seemed almost as though life had come to a standstill. Now, this may be true for some of you people. You may feel that you are being passed up. You may feel that opportunities are slipping away. You may even feel that your life is slipping away and you aren't achieving very much. I urge you to trust the Master. I urge you to genuinely trust Christ, that he does know what he's doing with you as an individual, that he knows what he's doing with the particular situation in which he's put you, that he is the all-wise one, that just as my understanding as a man was so much greater than the dog's as a dog, so God's understanding of all the situations which touch on my life are infinitely greater than mine are, and that I can trust him with my life. I can put myself into his hands, and I will be faithful wherever he puts me. No matter how unexciting it may seem at the time, no matter how quiet and still it may be. The next great lesson that I learned there, and it was one which was to stand me in good stead much later in life, was I was always very deeply touched at this dog's willingness to go into the most difficult situation and go gladly. As I tried to portray for you, we had broken, rough country in which there were brambles and wild roses in profusion and windfowls and down timber and so on. And the sheep being the kind of animals that they are, they go exploring into all of these places looking for those tasty mouthfuls of grass that they've never been able to pick up somewhere else. And I knew they were in there. She didn't know. But I would send her out. And I would say, Lass, fetch him out. Fetch him out. Bring him out till the full count is here. You see, we were always counting sheep. Not in our sleep, but wide away. That's how we kept record. Because where I lived, we had cougars. We, we lost a lot of sheep to cougars and to stray dogs. And so the sheep were continually being counted. And, 
and I could tell if any were missing. And so she would go into these tough situations, into these difficult situations, so gladly, so enthusiastically. And God, by his gracious spirit, spoke to me and said, Philip, if this dog is willing to do this for you, if this dog is willing to face this kind of hardship without questioning, without debating, without holding back, without any restraints, are you? Are you willing to go where I'm going to send you? Are you willing to face the tif- tough situation where I may call you to go? Are you willing to go into places where your neighbors and your friends will say you're foolish to go there? Nobody in their right mind would do a thing like that. Are you willing, in a sense, to be abandoned to God just as this dog was abandoned to me? And it wasn't long after this, I have to share this little insight with you, that one day an agent of the government came in and told my wife and I totally unexpectedly, he said, you're going to lose this whole ranch because we're going to take it for military purposes. And God was going to call us to go into much more difficult situations, to go into places that were tough, places that were very dangerous. And the question was, was I ready to go? Was I prepared to do the thing God was going to ask me to do, just as I had asked the dog? Unless we are, unless we are, this person, that person, this family, that group of people will not be touched, will not be brought to the Savior in the way he intended. The responsibility rests with us. And I realize as I teach Bible study groups all over the country from time to time that the one thing which God is looking for increasingly are men and women who simply will be totally available to his purposes, who are willing and eager, if necessary, to be abandoned to the purposes of God, who when God opens an opportunity and sends them on a mission, will go. And it doesn't have to be something necessarily spectacular. It doesn't have to be something dramatic. It may be just to speak to a neighbor that we'd rather not speak to. It may be to witness to a business associate that we'd just rather not witness to. It may be to undertake some simple thing, or it may be a difficult thing. But God calls to us and invites us to go out in order that through our willingness to cooperate, our willingness to obey, just as with Lassie, others would come in. Then I told you a little bit about the problems with her and crows and sparks. And that was another very significant thing which God brought to my attention. Very often when I would entrust her with some responsibility of holding a bunch of sheep in a particular setting or guarding a gate or even just keeping a couple of rams in a corner or something of this kind and she would break faith. We call that breaking faith in handling a dog like this. And she would be distracted and drawn away to follow the crows or to follow the sparks and chase them and expend her energy in this way. God, by his spirit, dealt with me very clearly about this issue. He said, Philip, there are going to be times in your life when I am going to give you very significant responsibilities, and I am going to expect you to be faithful in that place where I have put you and in that calling to which I have called you. Now, are you going to be distracted? Are you going to be drawn away into something which often appears very spectacular, may appear very dramatic, may even in the world's estimation appear as a great show? I speak now particularly to those of you who are more mature Christians. This is one of the great dangers which faces all of us. We live in a contemporary world and in a contemporary society in which there is great, great emphasis put upon success and put upon that which is spectacular and which is put upon that which is sort of overpowering. 
and it tends very often to draw us away on tangents which are not essentially the will and the purpose of God for us. And it is in such cases where we must seek very carefully to know what the mind of God is in the matter. It is then that we must very carefully come before him and seek his face and discern what the Spirit of God would say to us in order that we might respond to the Spirit of God and in any given situation do that which is essentially the will of God. And more often than not, it is to be faithful where God has placed us is to be faithful in that place and not betray the trust which he has put in our care. Sometimes we betray that trust. Increasingly, as I have gotten to be an older man, I have endeavored always to weigh very carefully the opportunities presented to me as God's person. And I have determined under God that I shall do his will insofar as I can do his will for his purposes upon the earth and for the benefit of his people. I do not want a coldness or an estrangement to come between me and my master where there will be occasion that he must discipline me. Now people often are a little bit under a misapprehension on this, and I would like to simply speak to this point for a moment, and it is this. May I remind you that whom the Lord loveth, he chastens. And very often the reason we are chastened is because we have been allowed, and we have allowed other things to distract us from that to which he has called us. And there will be a disciplining, and there will be a correcting, but in his gracious and marvelous and generous way, he also reassures us that the bonds of fellowship and love between us have been restored. And we can tell as we confess to him openly and candidly, Lord, I have failed you. Lord, I have actually disappointed you. There is this restitution and there is this cleansing and there is this reconciliation that comes between us and him. And what a wondrous thing, just as exciting as when Lassie used to rush around in a circle and leap into my arms with ecstatic delight because of the reconciliation between us. And so may I leave you with this thought. It is possible for you to go on year after year serving, working with God, being, if you wish, his co-worker and seeing through your mutual cooperation and your mutual relationship and this bond of love and trust between you that out of it great blessing comes. Blessing to him, blessing to you, and blessing to others. Thank you very much.